foundations in here. I will give you that. And this is another part. You submit everything first May inside and online. Okay. So now try to understand how to do this. Thing. And uh, it's a real one. Yeah, yeah, I will touch on it. Mm -hmm. So continuing from where we were in terms of the monitoring, um, again this is an example where uh, depending upon whether the structure is sensitive or model is sensitive, so the classification has to be based on what type of structure you have surrounding the basement or structure that you are building. So we have uh, various important buildings, you can see being a royal but very sensitive structure, so these are the green amber and then We've got a red zone. We've got to ensure that um, every structure is identified surrounding and also classified in terms of the in terms of the sensitivity of the building. The other thing is also about frequency monitoring. So in the initial stages again you have to understand because most of these systems are now electronic. Most of them are computerized, most of the things are uh, real-time readings. So you get a horrendous amount of data because every second is being monitored as you are living. And I think um, it is very important to agree the frequency of the monitoring in terms of what is the, uh, what are the intervals. Do I do it every day? Do I do it every 24 hours? Or do I do it every 6 hours? And that has to be related to your construction program. If you are digging very quickly, you may have to you know, decrease your monitoring frequency. If you are digging very slowly, then you have to increase your monitoring frequency. And long term movements, the importance of the structure is also. Those are the things that you need to consider in terms of agreeing what is the frequency of monitoring that I'm going to do for all the monitoring that I talked about, whether it is settlements or wall movements or road movements or gas pipes or engineers, whatever. And I think we, these days, in manual, as I was saying, some of them are depending on the structure, you may choose manual, some of them depending on the fiber optics type of readings where you get automatic reading onto your desktop and everybody can see what is happening, how the whole thing is moving. And uh, I think the uh, other important thing is also how long after the construction. Remember, the contractors or the designers, whoever is doing the DNB, design and build jobs, their liability is still uh, is, is going on after the construction period, what we call defect liability. So defect liability period varies from project to project. It could be two years, it could be ten years, it could be five years, depending upon what is written in the contract. So you've got to ensure that you have enough monitoring because somewhere down the line, uh, two years down the line, things might drop. So somebody might come and say, hang on, you dug this for two years ago, or you built this two years ago, where is your monitoring, what happened? How do you actually protect yourself that you continue to monitor? Uh, so again, you know, if it is a prism, 60 minute intervals, if it is prisms on the beam level, probably twice per week, all in kilometers twice per week until the final completed property. So depending upon the dig sequence, sometimes you may do it every day, sometimes you because you know, dig takes a long time. There's no point in monitoring because if you are dropping the ground by one meter to excavate all that area, it takes roughly about, you know, a week. So there's no point in monitoring until you drop the ground to about a meter. Yeah? So sometimes it's a week. If you're digging very quickly next to the wall, then you may have to do it every day. Depends on how much you control. So those are the suggested things that for one of the projects where uh, we agree the frequency of monitoring um, and uh, Again, I talked about the traffic light systems in terms of the uh, 3D, 2D movements and um, what is it we have to use. Uh, it varies from structure to structure as you can see. We are talking about a couple of millimeters here. So it's so sensitive. It's not a lot. And the damage, as I was saying before, I can't emphasize anymore that if the damage is done, damage is done. It's a limit. There's no going back. So the contractors so got to ensure that uh, those are monitored very accurately with close tight tolerances. Um, in terms of the vibrations, when you're actually when you got a sort of structure next to the tunnels and uh, again, those are the limits that we use on one of the projects. It varies from project to project, underground structures, tunnels generally about 15 millimeters per second is one of the ISOs and British standards, old British standards talk about. Um, this is because we were, you can see the, the tunnel and this is the footprint of the building, that we, this is the cores we are talking about, this is the concrete, concrete cores where you got the stairs and lifts, that's the structure that we are building in different blocks. We have a tunnel here, 
the section of the tendon looks like this. We were monitoring at the crown and also at the shoulder points. All around the footprint of that building. Because that's the footprint of the building. You need to demonstrate how long, how wide. Yeah? It's not just your footprint of the building. You need to go a little bit beyond also. So the, the area, shaded area, is the area where we are monitoring at regular intervals of a slice of the tunnel. So these are all automated readings that are coming while we are doing the piling and what we are working here. And then we know what sort of trigger levels we are looking at in terms of the wounds of the tunnels. So that's what we agreed with the client. This is one of the most important tunnels. Um, again, you know, uh, what should we do? If you got green, fine. Deformation is that range, 5 to millimeter mm proceed. If you got amber, stop and increase monitoring to subject to further checks on establishing the reasons. And then red, you stop carry for the inspection of the reasons before proceeding further. So, again, a system where you manage all the deformations that are happening. So, how you manage, how you control is also very important. So, you have to have a method statement in terms of the monitoring. So that brings us to the exercise that um, we are going to be able to do, as we said, uh, around the May. Um, I'll just open it up and uh, so what is this about? So what we have here is a real structure of a basement. What you're seeing is a footprint of a structure, which is uh, roughly, I think, that's about 25, 30, me 30 meters. And that is actually some, something like 140 meters. It's a very narrow site, surrounded by the facade, gantries, you can see the buildings, adjacent buildings. So if you go down here, you can see all the properties, like in semi-detached buildings. So you can see here, studio place, these are all occupied, and then there are um, other buildings here. So you've got those buildings, you've got those buildings, and you've got a uh, road, uh, which is the main nice bridge road, um, and then you've got a facade retention on there. So this is what we are actually excavating. So if you take a slice through there, that's the plan view. We take a slice through there, that's how it looks. So our ground level is here, night speed zero. So we go to the second piles, capping beam, and drop the ground, and then put the prop. Because also the ground level is varying from one end to the other end. This is another complication. So the forces are coming, and the wall forces are different on this side, wall forces are different on this side. So the ground here is here, the ground on the other side is very high. So we're putting a sort of a fly through prop. Uh, approximately 14 meters and with a splice so you can lift it and hold it. So what, and that's, that's the formation level, that's where we have to dig it to. Yeah? So that's the typical cross section. So we want to ide idealize that, so that's the sort of real scenario. So what I have idealized, I can idealize the scheme. So let us make the center line symmetry, and this box is 100 meters long, and it's a 25 meters wide, so this is the box you are excavating. And these are the fly-through props from one end to the other end. So we are actually going to be with long props. Spaced at roughly 8 or 10 meters, I think I've given... Um, so if you look at the, if you look at the cross-section, what you're doing here is um, the ground level here, do the secant piles. We said this is all under a place stiff. Cast the capping beam, and then we put the prop and then excavate it on this level. So that's the ground level. We drop into 0.8 meters, so that means we are digging almost 9 meters. In the toe level, we are going about 5 meters below the ground. Of, yeah, minus 5. That means roughly about 6 meters below this formation level. And second pile, 600 air, 900 percent per center. So that's, and I have classified that as a BF. This is the one which I talked about, the pressure diagram at the back. So let us assume a simplistic pressure diagram at the back of the wall. Using the BF, I talked about what is a classified uh, pressure diagram. So the first thing is, use stiff London clay. Yeah, pressure profile, BF, and then you calculate the load on the wall. I talked about the load on the wall, so once you know the shift, you can calculate the load on the wall. And then you calculate deflection using beam and elastic foundation and simply support it. Yeah? So, if you use, uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the book called Hetany. This one. Or Rose. So this gives you formulas. Yeah? Make sense? Yeah, remember the big three yeah. elastic yeah. yeah. So, so if you take that wall, so what we are talking about is that being a wall, a pressure distribution, some sort of an idealized pressure distribution, 
So this is a series of springs. Because we put a prop there, it's simply supported between those two points. So you use a simply supported beam elastic foundation principle. Work out what the deformations are, that is delta. So the wall is going to go like that. So you work out the delta, you work out the bending moment and shear force in the wall. Make sense? Because you also remember you have to go back to your my last week presentation of calculating the stiffness of this wall. Okay, every 600 locked at point A. D. Do you, I remember I told you was a male pile and female pile. So you have to work out what is the stiffness using the formula that is given in the previous previous slide based on the spacing of the piles. So you know the stiffness. So if I remember, T I minus K Y is equal to P. Yeah, that's K is the elastic subgrade stiffness. That's the E I is the stiffness of concrete wall, secret wall. So you use what is called beta parameters in beam elastic formation. You work out that beta and then use this closed form solution. I want you to do this by hand before you do it into very sophisticated financial analysis. I just use a, a closed form solution, meaning a simply supported beam with a uniform load. The hetany or roads will give you what is the bending moment, what is the shear force, what is the deflection. Mm -hmm. Maximum mm -hmm. is what we're interested in. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it gives you the bending moment and shear force and the deflections. And then you can go back into your final analysis, whatever software you are familiar with. But because it's an idealized scenario, you have to do it by hand, tell what the load, what the bending moment is. Remember, this spring stiffness is what K is what we are using. So the K value for the London clay, you can take for all practical purpose, is equal to E dash by B, because that is B, and stiffness of the London clay you can take as 50,000 kilonewton per meter square, divided by B of the wall is roughly 1 meter. So your E value, K value, the stiffness value is 50,000 kilonewton per meter cube. I think that is missing in assignment. Perhaps we want to take a note of this. So this is, remember, what is called modulus of subgrade reaction in beam and elastic foundation. Remember the units are force per meter cube. Yeah? This is not a stiffness as in kilonewton per square meter. It's for a unit width of the pile, which is that. So use that and then use this equation. Use the boundary conditions as simply supported because we're putting a prop at the top. Uh, and then this is the formation level, it's a simply supported beam. Does it make sense? Yeah, what is the B is the nothing but your that pile. It's the weight. Yeah. yeah. Generally, generally that is. But I think you can take for all practical purposes a meter. Uh, what? Good, good, good question. I think in the olden days, elastic subgrade reaction is what used in all beam elastic foundations. The reason is, if you got if you apply a unit deformation, the grounds reaction with the pressure. So that is why they come up with a. You know, if you apply, if you take a soil sample, you apply unit displacement. That's in meters, yeah, or millimeters, yeah. And the ground reacts with the pressure. So the pressure is force per L square. So force by L square divided by L is the unit stiffness. Yeah. So normally, if it is a, a, a triaxial test. It's like kilonewton per meter. Cube. And then by per meter. Meter square per meter. Okay. So, so basically, you take kilonewton per meter square, as you say, per meter okay. of deformation. So it's That's why kilonewton per meter. Okay. So all beam and elastic foundation talk about uh, elastic subgrade stiffness, which is measured in always kilonewton per meter cube. Because ground reacts with the pressure. That is why I think all the equations in, whether you follow Hetany or Rogues, it talks about horizontal subgrade stiffness or a vertical subgrade stiffness. Yeah? So you can take that unit and then work out what is the uh, what is the scenario in terms of the bending moments and shear forces. So what we are interested in. Yeah? Because I'm going to use the flat to sort of software. You could use it, but I don't want you to use the oh, okay. first you can do the hand calculation, then, then you can supplement, see how better results will come. Because hand calculations are always important. Engineers forget to do hand calculations. So for the springs that you model along the pile itself, would you use that? K? Yeah, that's it. That's the K. Yeah, that's the K. So if you, if you, I don't know if you guys are familiar, if you use um, Hetany for that equation, 
19. Obviously, the fourth order differential equation. Yeah. So the y is equal to a1 cos beta x plus a2 sine beta x plus a3 plus a4. There are four equations. Yeah. Four components. Yeah. Okay. So those boundary conditions you solve are simple. If you turn this around, basically what you got that wall drop there, and this is your formation. And the pressure what we talked about is this from the ground and these are your strings. Make sense? Okay. This is simply supported. So that's the beam of length L, which is nothing but your dig height, which is x. That's the height of the dig. Make sense? Height of the dig is nothing but your length of the beam. Okay, yeah. Turn it around, the pressure is pressure. Those springs are those springs. So the any of the textbooks will give you a coefficient if you know the stiffness properties of this, which is nothing but even EI, concrete stiffness and the pile stiffness. This gives you a coefficient for bending moment, shear force, and deformation. It's very simple. You're basically, solving that equation, they have already solved that for you in the simply supported boundary condition. Yeah, it's already done. So basically, he gives uh, the, the table gives you what is called A1, A2, A3, A4 all related to shear force, bending moment, and delta. So you use that, yeah? Could you clarify, is this head based on the infinite beam? No, because this is going to be a finite beam, isn't it? Yes, you could use infinite beam, provided we are going very deep basement, and our toe levels of the piles are very deep. Yeah. But this is not infinite beam. I was under the impression that head tenny was based on an infinite beam. No, it gives you equations for finite length of the beams also. Okay. It is a very uh, thick book. Yeah. And then because of all the formulas. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Hetany is the son-in-law of Tivoshenko. Tivoshenko, yeah. So Hetany gives his son-in-law. Yeah. Absolutely. He wrote a book on this. So yeah. It's a monograph. Yeah. Hetany yeah. gives you and equations for what is called the right. It gives you starts with infinite beam because it's easy to define. Yeah. Then it comes with the semi-infinite beam. Then it talks about finite length. Okay. It talks about all the three. It also talks about boundary conditions. As you remember, this prop. If it is a prop like that, it can rotate, which is why I'm saying it's simply supported. Yeah? yeah? So the boundary conditions for this beam, simply supported, simply supported. That means we are allowing rotation here. You could do fix here. That means you have to make the prop is fixed to the capping beam. Yeah? And that's going to be expensive. We can't do that. That is why I'm assuming take a simply supported condition where it's very simple to estimate. So once you know that, you can calculate a simply a coefficient is given depending on the parameter what is called beta x. Remember beta x? Beta is equal to fourth root of K by EI. EI. Yeah? That's the beta. So that is a factor which defines the wavelength parameter of the beam and elastic foundation. K is your horizontal or vertical subject stiffness. EI is the property. Fourth root of this. Yeah? And that beta, so it's beta times your H. So this table is given as a function of beta H. So you calculate your beta. You know the height of the dig. Yeah? So beta h, you read the table, a1, a2, a3, it will give you when moment shear force. It's simply the multiplication of the load times that. Yeah? Makes sense? I think if you go to the book, it's very simple. It's, it's, and it's so simple, I think we can't get it wrong. Yeah? So the reason I want you to do is because it is very important. If you go into the computers, you always get lots of stuff. It's all guy go scenario. Yeah? Garbage in, garbage out. So we don't know. We want you to get a feel of the numbers in terms of what is the bending moment, what is the shear force. Is it 500? Is it 5,000? You need to get a feel of the numbers. So if you do this hand calculation, you will see, right, when the bending moment is 500, that means wall is about a meter thick. If you get 5,000, is something wrong. Yeah? Same thing with the displacement. If you do a simply supported without ignoring this one, 10 meter beam will, will roughly deflect span by 500. It's about 20 millimeter. Yeah? If you got a beam, which is, imagine this is about 6 or 7 and a half meters, that beam deflection is span divided by 500. That's the sort of number that we normally expect. But because the beam and elastic foundation, it will be one quarter of one. Yeah? You see what I'm saying? Because if, you, if, you, if it is a, it's a free beam like this, for that loading, it will deflect like a simply supported beam like that, yes? Easy. And that will be height divided by 500. So 10 meter means 20 millimeter beam, 20 millimeter deflection. So, because we know in reality lots of springs here, that ground is also giving you stiffness. 
and that deflection will be very much reduced mm -hmm. compared to a beam in the air. Yeah. So that gives you an idea of what is the beam like this and the beam that is buried in soil. It has to move less, isn't it? So you work out, uh, you use a chart to calculate those bending moments and shear forces. Now, if you remember in the previous uh, thing, once you know the deflection here, I showed you one graph in the previous presentation. So, so H by delta related to ground displacement. So we said if the ground is moving like this, it is related to ground going like this, here, in the back of the wall, yeah? Let me draw it again. That's the ground level. So that's our prop. That's our formation level where we are digging to. That's the toe level of the pipe. So we said if that is a prop, the deformation of this ground, of that prop, of the wall, is something like that. Yes? So that means at the back of the wall, the same gets reflected like this. Yeah? I showed you a graph, the relationship between these two. If this moves from your beam elastic foundation 20 millimeter, there is a relationship. If that is 20, that is normally 10 millimeters. You can read the chart. It tells you what is the relationship between that horizontal movement to this vertical settlement of these buildings or whatever pipes you've got. Does it make sense? Yeah? So there is a chart how you relate what you have computed by beam elastic foundation, how much the beam has moved, the relationship between that and that. How much ground is sinking. Yeah? So you calculate that using that chart. And then, as I said, uh, Hattonian gives also the bending moment and shear force in the wall. And then you also work out the, this, the properties that I showed you is um, they're all zero to one category. So if you can make a note, I don't think I made it very clear. Those buildings all around, what you are seeing there, all buildings are zero to one category. So again, I explain to you what is a zero category. No damage, no strains, no cracks. Yeah. So they cannot accept any crack in these buildings. So the zero to one category. So you look at the damage category, and I want you to work out what is the risk assessment that you have to do. So basically, you have to, once you relate the ground movement, you should say the building category damage is this, and then you suggest what is the method of controlling that. Suppose you do this, you end up with the 20 millimeters, and then damage category allows you to do only 5 millimeters, then you have to suggest a way of controlling it. Right, okay. Dig 2 meters, put a prop, dig 2 meters, put a prop, and so on. Yeah, so you put a multi level props. So I want you to make a risk assessment. Does it make sense? Yeah? So this exercise is how we idealize a particular structure. How do we calculate by hand the loads on the wall? How do we translate that load in the wall into bending moment, shear forces, and the wall movements? How do we relate the wall movement to the ground displacement? Once we know the ground displacement, we can tell what the buildings are doing by damage category. So you look at that, so that's the relationship. Those are the three key things you should remember. Make sense? Yeah? So I think with that one, so as Subi said, you've got a bit of time, so you can, uh, you're until the end of May or something. First of May. First of May. The first of May is just okay. to that, right? I think with that one, I have finished. We get feedback by two. So in this exercise sheet, um, so those are the three pages are given, idealized scenario, and I explain the steps, you follow the steps, and then you give a simple summary. I want only two page hand calculations, two page, no more than that. I don't want millions of calculations. I just want a simple two page calculation. What is the bending moment? What is the shear force? What is the deformation? How do you relate to the? What chart do you use from the presentation one, which is the previous one? And what is the displacement you calculate? You can do final element analysis, whatever you like. You know, at the end of the day, there is only the refinement of what you are doing by hand. But you must feel the numbers. You must see what is the bending moment. What does it do to the wall? Yeah? Because yeah. I I give it to the graduates. They come up with the five thousand kilonewton. I said go away. Something wrong. 
the final element somebody came up with the 5000 because the e value you put is units are wrong yeah so you must have a feel of when you are digging 10 meters what is the bending moment when you are digging 15 meters what is the bending moment so you can do a small if there is a beam elastic foundation chart you can have a feel of if my height of the dig is 10 meters what is the bending moment what is the diameter of the pile I should have this is what I was saying you want to put a very deep you end up with a two and a half meter diameter pile so that gives you that is a starting point to decide what is the diameter of the pile I must have if I want to use only one level prop. Remember, I don't want you to do 10 levels of props because I can't build it. You've got to think practical in that sense also. Yeah? So those th key three things are very important. You should all be able to do by hand. You don't need a computer. Approximate figures. Always engineers should learn from the mistakes and learn from the failures and also feel the numbers but approximate numbers, what I call back of the number. If you can't do it, I think you know you will not be a successful engineer. If you rely too much on the computer, it is not a good way of learning things. Getting feel of the numbers is very important in engineering. I've seen things going dramatically wrong in big structures, massive structures. I've seen somebody doing a simple calculation. Again, you know, you go back to simple principles. I mean, I can talk about this for ages, but I know I got only five minutes to. We were doing a big structure. That's the water level. That's the sea bend. Four-legged concrete structure with big cylinders. That water level is about 130 meters. So if you look at the cells, how the cells are distributed in plan, so we got cell like that, another cell like that, another cell like that. So these are the concrete cells, concrete cylinders, storage cylinders. So if you look at this triangle here, that is exposed to water. The water can get in. That is not closed. So the, between the cylinders, when we put the three cylinders together on the seabed, the gap is not closed. The water can get in. So if you imagine, this is sitting on the seabed of 130 meters. So 130 meters, this triangle is subjected to 130 meters of water. Yes? The pressure at the bottom of that triangle is 130 meters of water. One can do a simple calculation because that is 5 meters. So if you've got 130 meters of water, you can see that wall is carrying 130 times 2.5 meters. Is the force carried by this point, carried by that point. Somebody did a finite element analysis, underestimated the shear force, underestimated the bending moment by a factor of 2 the whole platform collapsed. It is very important to check the numbers by hand. The starting point has to be a hand calculation. You do a fantastic final element analysis, 3D, whatever, you know, you can do millions of final put it on the supercomputer, NASA, whatever you want to run. At the end of the day, somebody should sit back and say, that cell is subjected to 130 meters of water. What is the force at that point? So that, you know, this is a concrete cylinder. So the rebar that is going from there to there should have a force of 130 times 10, 1300 kilonewtons of force times two and a half. That's the rebar. That rebar is not anchored properly. It pulled out, it opened the joint, cylinder got flooded, the whole platform. It scared the entire world about concrete platforms. The Condi one. Yes, the Condi one. Yeah, it happened in the 1990s. So, again, when we are doing offshore structures, we do massive, massive, massive final element analysis without going back to basics. The basics have to be verified before you give this one. So that is why I'm saying I am very keen that all engineers do a simple hand calculation. Go back to simple basics of what you know. You can idealize everything into a very simple mechanism. Absolutely. You won't get it wrong. You will be very conservative as a starting point, but you get a feel of the numbers. When I look at that uh, anchor, that anchor has to be 
fully anchored. So the reinforcement had only 400 millimeters instead of being two meters deep, two meters anchored, and pulled out. So you don't need a finite element analysis for that. You simply put the pressure, you work out. Same thing here. When you got a when you got a, a beam on elastic foundation scenario, I don't need a finite element analysis. I don't need until unless I'm going to a very complicated fossil. So what I know, once I know the pressure there, and I put there, and then I put another prop there, is a continuous beam, simply supported, simply supported, two level beam, or a single level beam. I just need to know what the beam is to shape for that. Make sense? So that's what it is. Anyway, so before uh, I go further, any questions? Before we close and ask for feedback, yeah? Well, the risk assessment will sort of found is it okay, a couple of pages or just paragraph or? Well, I think again, if you have designed a beam, Pile, pile is not different. You calculate the bending moment. Yeah, if you design a concrete beam, you can you can put your chart, but that's all standard. There's nothing new about it. So you can do if you want, because this pile is subject to lateral bending moment, so you can do interaction axle and, and so you've got a pile so which is reinforced. So once you calculate the bending moment in the pile, M and V, you can do a circular column analysis to determine. But I don't need I mean, all that. I mean, I think what all I want is, is simply what the stress levels are. You just calculate M divided by Z. That's all I need to know. So you calculate your bending moment divided by Z is your stress. Yeah? Z is the modulus. So you need to get the sweetener platform. Sweetener conduit. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, if you want to calculate the capacity of the, by putting the lead bar and all this, you can tell me about it. But I want just two page calculations of forces, bending moment, shear force, the damage category. Then you can go into detail of a rebar cage design. You can use a chart, circular column, basically. Bending moment is something, it's nothing but you're designing a beam, isn't it? Because it's all one way beam. We talked about, remember, we're putting enforcement in only uh, secondary pile, preliminary pile, we just bump, you know, just pouring lean concrete. So, if you remember about um, our uh, secrets, we are putting V bar only in there. That is, so that's the preliminary, that's the secondary pipe. So, we are only putting V bar in so, so, you can design like a beam, yeah, and tell me what the V bar that you got for your district. Make sense? Any questions? Yeah. Um, so the yes, so the, 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 the last part, if you don't have any questions, can you please give me the feedback, which is the page number four, I think, on the assignment. Okay, the separate one. So you go to separate one, okay, thank you. So if you can fill that, please, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's up to you. Give it now. No, no, no. But I want the feedback now, sir. Yeah, please, please, yeah. before you go. Then you can improve this one yeah. next year. So, so we know what you like, what you didn't like, how, how we can improve this six hours of lecturing next week. Yes. I will take. I, I, will, I, will, I will email, I will make it a nice one, everything. I will, I will put a mark criteria, everything. Okay. I will put, I will put, uh, I will put, Give a marking criteria what is required.